Cole, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Dylan. Good to be here with you, <laughs> and thanks for the opportunity. Anytime. But uh, of, firstly, we're in the middle of our hunting season, and you taking out time out of your busy schedule to come over and just have a chat to me, really. It means the world to me. Um, oh, absolute pleasure, man. So we, we did chat a little bit earlier on how John X was formed, how it started. I don't know if you want to just maybe tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so uh, back in 1983, uh, our family, my mom and dad, newlyweds, based at a little tiny station at Merriman in the Great Karoo. Um, and my mom and dad initially did a bit of culling, did things like that, and, and, and just saw the opportunity with foreign hunters. Traveled to the US, and so it began. That was late 1982 and 83, we got our first hunters. And we called Merriman and the Great Karoo our main base for close on 15, 20 years. And then uh, saw the need to move, move to close to the airports. We were four, five, six hours away from the nearest airport at Merriman. And obviously the need for Kudu as well saw us moving into the East Cap. And at the time, we actually went and based ourselves uh, where Arthur Rudman and them are today. At okay. the time, the Rudmans were actually not running a safari business yet. Uh, they were just goat farming, they had a lot of extra game, and, and we, we then set up a base there. And yeah, so things evolved. We then purchased Lalibella, uh, well, the first farms towards what became Lalibella Game Reserve. And we were there for 20 years. And then in 2016, uh, we, we, we got an opportunity and we, we sold Lalibella and we moved here to Woodlands, which has been our, our base and home ever since. And, and today, we, we've, together with Woodlands, we've got Bunfontein, our new base in the north. Uh, in the Cradock Croft Neck district. And yeah, so exciting future ahead, exciting times. We've, we've got a lot of developments and it's a privilege to be a part of the industry and in a family business like my, like, like we are. Uh, we're very lucky, both Lee and myself and our families, very lucky for the sacrifice our parents made uh, to afford us this opportunity. So, so much of this, uh, you know, thanks to my dad, Rick, my mom, Sue, for those hard yards. So, yeah, gives us a hell of a uh, opportunity to, to, to go and grow and, and be able to offer what we do today. When, when we look at John X safaris, and I, 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 I'm sitting in a very fortunate position to look at it from the outside in, when, when a lot of us see John X safaris, we immediately think conservation. What, what was the turning point that you realized in your career that that was, I would like to say you focused on, because it's, it's evident wherever you look, I mean, from your YouTube videos, social media platforms, the way you manage your game is, is absolutely incredible. It's something very rare we see in the industry. Is that something that's always just been a driving point in your? Um, you know, I think initially um, we didn't know how to communicate it. I think it's something that's always been a culture in John X Faris. And, uh, you know, because we hail from the Karoo, we Karoo stock, um, I think as long as I can remember, I always remember my dad telling me that people get it so wrong. People always focus on the animals. Mm. And th that is the biggest mistake you can make. Um, we, we all are, truth, truth be told, we're all custodians of the soil. So if your soil isn't right, your food isn't right, your animals won't be right. But most guys go and invest in genetics or in an ideology that sees this huge focus on wildlife, yet the, the building blocks below the wildlife to create success of the wildlife is not necessarily healthy or right. So because the Karoo can teach you harsh lessons, I think we, we grew up in that environment. My dad's a Karoo boy, I grew up in the Karoo. So we learned a lot of those important factors in, in, in what it takes to be able to run wildlife successfully. And then obviously combining that ideology with hunting from the bottom up. And, and this is something that, that, that we use as a team, uh, it's something we've taught our hunters today. It is part of our mission, part of our goals, where we spend a lot of time explaining to hunters why we will not hunt certain animals. Mm. If you come across that incredible kudu bull, but he's not of a of an age where he's past his prime, we are not going to hunt him. And and in the beginning, you know, I would say when I took over the business now, 20, 21 years ago. Um, it was a difficult conversation. As a young man, you sit there and, you know, you're trying to please a client. We're all PHs. We're all in this industry together. We, we're trying to do what is best then and there in the moment. But when one, when one thinks about it and you sit around the pub with your mates, with the PHs, the guys guiding with you, the guys that are having to answer to the clients year in, year out, season in, season out, you're sitting there going, 
guys, you know, it, it is getting tougher finding those kudubuls. It is getting tougher finding those farleys. All those special ESCAP things that, that we're all so proud about. Um, when, when we all sat down and said, you know what, what is the right thing? What's going to make our jobs easier? Uh, that was the turning point. And we started communicating that. Where we, we, we took the time to not shun the, the away from the big bull. We explained why we're not going to hunt that Eden bull in the cows. We explained why that kudu bull is superb. But in this moment, he's not the right bull to hunt. And so the minute our clients saw this and this responsible message came through, they were like, we want to be a part of this. And that was a big, big driving factor. The minute everybody got on board, and, and, and then I'm very lucky. You know, it, it takes a very strong culture from your fresh hunting team to be able to pull that through. It's all good and well. I communicate all the right things. I do all the right things. If they themselves in the field, when I'm not with them, don't do that themselves when they guide, it will never happen. So I was very lucky, you know, from my dad's time, you know, Greg Hayes, today's our head PhD. You know, for, for me, I was a six-year-old boy. Greg used to take me to school. So a guy like that, I entrust with so much of the vision and the ideology. Uh, then Ed Wilson, been with us for 30 years. These are names in the Eastern Cape that are that have grown from from you know from out of out of stock that that came from hunting in the sense of they always knew what it was about, but they took it to the next level. And, and so many young PHs look up to these guys, and I'm very lucky in our team that I'm able to call on these guys who were older brothers to me who had started under my dad to be able to to to, to kind of round up this core group of fresh hunters with this vision and to enforce it. It's all good and well. You sit, you talk about it. But when you're under the pressure and it's day nine of a tender hunt and that kudu bull steps out, you better trust the system. You better trust your, your rest of your teammates and you better trust your areas. And we were able to bring those things together. And yes, we still live. We still learn. We, we still don't have all the answers. Don't fool yourself. We still make plenty of mistakes like all of us do in the field. But I think we're closer to what we were 20 years ago to that perfect balance of the conservation, right animal, and age-based hunting, where in my dad's time, it was all about lengths. Everything was about the record mm -hmm. book. Today, I would confidently say to you that I appreciate everything Safari Club International has done for us. And without the record book, this industry would not have grown. Mm -hmm. I would not enjoy the career I enjoy today. But I do think it might be time for that conversation where the SEI record book becomes more of a scientific journal than what it is today. I think the anti-hunting fraternity throws that at us. Is this book needed? Is it truly a, a scientific record-keeping journal? These are some of the conversations going forward that our generation, we're going to have to tackle, we're going to have to look at. And, and it's a difficult conversation because all of us get hunters from those organizations. But those organizations are doing fantastic jobs together with ourselves on the ground, seeing the industry grow, and not only that, seeing our wildlife grow. So. You know, combining all these things, it's a sensitive matter in the industry. You know, we're all trying to survive. Times are tough. Uh, we, we're all trying to see our, 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 our own survival in the sense of not only ourselves as outfitters, but the rest of our team to build a team and sustainability of, you know, you're trying to get guys through 10, 15, 20 year mm -hmm. careers with one company. Uh, it, it takes a lot year in and year out to be able to achieve that. So yeah, a lot of challenges ahead, but for us, we feel we're getting to that point where the balance is most certainly there. Out of this whole time I'm just listening to, you never mentioned anything when it comes to financial implications and, and growth. When, <clears throat> when I look back at, at the industry as a whole, and I'm, I'm very fortunate that I've experienced a lot of it, right? I somehow think that there were more outfitters and professional hunters based around exactly what you've just said but the the push the dollar push became a little bit too much and egging over i mean i had a conversation with a guy the other day and a couple of years ago when when i said at scr for the first time we were selling sable special at five thousand dollars or whatever it may be at that time um and it wasn't near what what the quality is now that we're shooting right how how easy or how difficult was it for you to not be absorbed into that? Because coming out of COVID, yeah. I mean, the stars just weren't in yeah. your favor at all. I mean, for, for a conservation pattern that you've based yourselves on. No, but, you know, Dylan, I, I think as a young man, I was very lucky. I, I signed up to go to Adrian Gardner's college. 
mm. initially. And Adrian Gardner, obviously at the time, owned Shamari Game Reserve. We were Lalibella. We were the competition up the road. And my dad always had this, he always had this belief that the, the best things you learn is from your, better, your biggest competitor. He told me one day, he said, you know, um, go, go and learn from Adrian Gardner. And, and long story short, the, the, the college, uh, it, it, they didn't get documentation permitting process correct. And that, that January, the college couldn't begin. And so there I was kind of, how now? And uh, my dad said, well, call Adrian Gardner. You did sign up to go to his university. Uh, gave me his number. I called Adrian Gardner. I said, Mr. Gardner, this is who I am. And he said, yes, young man, I know who you are. Uh, I said, Mr. Gardner, I've got a problem. I need a job. He said, well, give your, your Andrew Bear a call tomorrow morning and be there at 7 o'clock. Well, the next morning at 5.30, I was at your Andrew Bear's office. I was desperate for a job. And I went and learned uh, at the time a lot about wildlife, a lot about how to deal with people, sometimes not what I, you know, not what I wanted in my life either. And, 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 and at that time, at Shamwari, what I did learn, and there was, a, there was a, it, it, Adrian Gardner's whole portfolio is the Mantis Collection. Mm. And their whole thing was the Bushmen believe that uh, uh, take care of the little things and the bigger things take care of themselves. Mm. And I've always lived my life by that. You know, if you ask me at any given time, where am I at on a safari financially? All my peers, everybody will tell you, I'm the worst. I have no idea. Because I promise you, if you as a fresh hunter, if you do the right things, you stick to the basics. There's absolutely no reason why the rest doesn't take care of itself. So in your business, and when it comes to price, many, many years ago, a very smart man from New York told my dad, you have three choices in your business. Price, quality, service. You can only have two. So pick which one's falling out. So from the beginning, I set prices up. I want quality and service. Price takes care of itself. And so, yes, financially, I'm not a big fan of the new way which I see around social media. I see various conservationists. They, they feel the need to, 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 to not go with the saying, if it pays, it stays. Unfortunately, that's reality. I sign a check every day. Fellow outfitters out there sign checks. And if it doesn't pay, it will not stay. So that's a reality we can't get away from. Uh, we have a, a unit of land. That unit has to be economical. And over and above that, we have various areas we hunt that belong to farmers, etc. And those units need to be economical as well. So we can, we can turn a blind eye to the economic importance, but it is one of the most important driving factors. I mean, we all go to work. Everybody, if you're a lawyer, if you're a doctor, you don't go to work for free any day. The same with us in our industry. But you got with, with our industry being the luxury industry. This is not needed in anybody's life. This is the first thing that's going to go. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important to, to steer clear of being caught in that money trap, the dollar trap, like I like to call it. Um, obviously, without it, there is no growth. And I'll, I'll, tell, I'll be the first to tell you a big reason of why I do this is the journey of growth. There is nothing I enjoy more than the journey of growth. Um, being able to bring in a new herd of Elan from Parks that I bought last year. That's one of the most exciting things I ever did in the eight years here at Woodlands. It's just upping those genetics. Um, bringing the Nyala in initially now, this year, for the first year, seeing the rewards of those efforts all those years ago, seven, eight years ago. Those are the things I really like. So yes, financial factor is a, it, it is a driving factor. Let's not beat around the bush. Um, I'm a, you know, you know at, at any given time, I'm the first to tell you that, that economically it has to work. Otherwise, the rest will not work. Do you, um, I mean, you, you mentioned you know what's going on. Do you kind of think your conversation or your story, John X's conservation efforts, is is a drop in the ocean compared to a, a lot of the terrible things that we've seen out there in our industry? Yeah, there they are fantastic outfitters out there. Mm. There are truly fantastic PHs. Uh, there are guys that, that I spend a lot of time with that are doing amazing, incredible things. Uh, we're so lucky in the Eastern Cape that, that the, the abundance, the variety, uh, and, and what we can offer sees guys offering some incredible things. I mean, I, I look around me and they are fellow guys in the industry that, that I look up to. 
that I say to myself, geez, that guy can really do that well. Look, look at his message. Look at his conservation model. Look what he's offering. And then look at his, look, look at his product. It's mm. like so much I've learned from. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a big one to, 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 I, I don't, I don't turn a blind eye to the, to the rotten apples in the industry. Uh, but every industry has them. Mm. If you go into Toyota salesman, uh, I can tell you right now, as, as solid as Toyota is as a product, I promise you I'll find you 10 terrible Toyota dealers who are doing terrible things that, 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 that no industry can afford. Yet, Toyota and the industry still survives. The same with the hunting industry. Um, I think a very important factor is uh, the sun can shine on anybody and everybody in this industry because there's a product for every client out there. Mm. It's very, very important. Mm. I have, I, I've, I've, I've always been amazed over the years at how sensitive guys are about clients. And, and a very dear friend of mine, oh, Perry Moorman from Pearson, my, my big mate out there, uh, Perry worked for us for many years. And, and there came a time in his life where his kids were going to college and everything. And Perry who, who's been a, a, a great role model for me as a human being and a great man and a dear friend, always said to me, he said to me, you know, if, 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 if I do my job right, there's no reason why my client mm. needs to, to leave or go somewhere else. So if my client decides to go, the problem and the fault only lies with me. And, and that is a, a, a big thing. And, and, and that, that's where a lot of the rot in the industry comes from, where there's a lot of animosity and things like that. I think if guys focused on themselves and their clients and stopped looking around at everybody else, sometimes you... you, you, you you can solve a lot of these problems and issues yeah. by not focusing too much on the others. Mm -hmm. Focus on what you're doing, what's your team, what are they doing? And, and I'll tell you what, like I say, I'll tell anybody, there's, there, there, there's a guy who needs the first time a package. There's a guy who needs our daily rate safari, more specialized hunt. There's a guy who's in the middle. There's a guy who's in the bottom. Isn't it wonderful that we are able to offer something and each one of us have a place in this industry to be able to offer that? And be able to make a living doing what we love ultimately you um did looking back at all these years that have gone past and stuff did you think that your efforts your conservation plan and, and portfolio that you've you've had do you think it would have had as as a big of impact as it has had in the industry to date you no way i mean geez dylan i i was just another ph trying to forge my way trying to i think come out of the shadow of my father i think it's very hard when when, when, when a guy like my dad has always been a big character in the industry, it's very difficult to get out of that. So I had to distance myself uh, very quickly from that. You know, my, my dad was a package guy. I immediately took that out of the business. Mm -hmm. I went to a daily rat hunt. I, I had a different vision because when I guided and PH in the beginning, I, ah, this wasn't the way I liked to hunt. So I changed a lot of that. But in saying that, through that change, I mean, I was just another young PH who just wanted to be accepted by his peers. A lot of these older guys I was hunting under who worked for my dad. I started at the bottom. I worked for Anton Marie up in Zululand. Um, I was very lucky uh, early on. I was not model cotton. My dad did not say to me, um, you do this, do that. Uh, the, 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 one of the greatest important things I learned from the beginning was like, you're on your own, go and do it. Mm. And so in that, I had to kind of find my own way. And did I see the conservation story coming? I don't think so. Truth be told, it, it, it all kind of unfolded on this vision and this dream. And I will tell you, the people who I met along the way, shit, what a role they played. Um, uh, the, I have a very dear friend in the Karoo. When in the beginning, I was 18, 19 years old, I, 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 we had a very dear friend of us pass in a motor car accident, a PH of ours, and I had to come back from Anton Marie up in Makuzi Falls in Natal, where I was doing my epi ship trying to do dangerous game time there and in Matetsi in Zimbabwe. I had to come back here due to a crisis and um, started hunting. I met a, a Karoo farmer, a guy who today is one of my dearest friends, Neil Scumby. And Neil would tell me about this vision in the Karoo and this conservation model. And today, Neil and I still do so much together. Mm. We have so much land tied up with farmers up there doing wonderful things and continue to do great things going forward for our Farleys, our Clippies, our uh, free-range kudu up there, things like that. So I met a lot of people along the way who guided me and helped me. Um, then I was very fortunate. I was taken under the wing by what I consider... I like to tease him, a second dad of mine today, Mark Aldane, the, the poster boy for conservation and hunting with Qatar 11 in Mozambique. 
um, at, at the time, you know, I was just a young PH needing a buffalo area. I sold sold a buffalo to the East Cap at the time, did not have the buffalo offer we have today. That was 15 years ago or so. I met the right guy right time. Mark said, come up here for two, three months, bring your hunters, let's see what you can do, and I'll give you a few more days in between. And so from being an appy to dragging roads for leopard hunting at night to spending many hours with him in helicopters, traveling around, somehow he afforded me the opportunity to be in his company. I learned a lot. I learned so much about the conservation uh, vision he had, the model he was at that time building. Uh, so, so right time, right place played a big role for me in, in, in what it has become and what I hope it will become. Uh, I, I do think I'm, I'm not nearly where the vision is and where I'd like to be. Uh, I, I think uh, by the time the next generation of this business comes in, it will be their turn to take a new direction. Yeah. At, at this time where we are at now in John X Forest, it, it, it's kind of my vision and I'm very lucky I have the support of my family. I have the support of uh, my wife who stands 200% by me and, and that's a very important factor in this. Uh, and then obviously my mom and dad, my sister Lee, uh, you know, we, we're very lucky. My brother-in-law, Gary, everybody has got a similar vision, you know, and, and, and where are we going with this? And, and I'm lucky they follow me on it. But, you know, the future is an exciting one. And I continue to learn from the Neil Scumbies, the, the, the Mark Aldanes, these guys who've had a profound impact on that. And then obviously my dad, who every day still, uh, you know, reiterates those important career lessons from all those years ago. You mentioned a lot um, learning and proving yourself and getting better at it. Do you often find that that might be one of the, we've all been there, young PHs in the industry, thinking we know it all? Yeah. Do you, do you often find as a young professional hunter that's one of the downfalls of anyone's attitude towards the industry? Yes and no. I think so many of the young PHs have the wrong idea of what the industry is. I, 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 I sometimes cringe to think do they understand their role mm. in, in, in this picture? Do they understand the importance of their week, their 10 days in somebody's dream? I think that's very important. Um, is, it, is it their fault? No, no, I don't think it's their fault. I think it's many of our faults. Mm. I think many of us have not installed that. Many of us has, have not explained the culture. I think some of the professional hunting schools could do a better job of pulling in some of the older heads, guys much older than me, to come and talk to the guys, explain a little bit about the culture and the importance. I think uh, the various professional hunters associations, yeah, and internationally, do a good job about that. But I think the young PHs sit far from the table just because it's intimidating. And because that intimidating factor is there, quite possibly it might be a better option to, to catch them young when they're at the schools and to maybe... Uh, instill and talk about that culture. Spend an evening or two with them. You know, explain to them the facts of, uh, of, 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 of the industry. But don't do it from the old Dugger Boy perspective. You mm -hmm. immediately create this, this, this gap. You know, these guys are already looking at you going, yo, this is an intimidating scenario. Um, I'm lucky. I'm a young outfitter. I don't, I, I'm lucky. I connect to the younger crowd. Yet the older crowd, I hear their side of the of the coin as well. You know, I sit both sides of the pub, so I see both sides of it. But if, if I look back and I think back, I can tell you right now, the biggest mistakes, I cringe at some of the things I did as a young fresh hunter. But we all go through that. We all hunt our way, th way through that. The lucky thing is a lot of our hunters coming also, it's their first time. It's not like they pros at it either. I think honesty plays a major role. Just last week, I, I hunted a return hunt with a guy I did my first ever hunt with. And what a wonderful trip it was with Cody Trowbridge, uh, this, a friend of mine from the US, and a trip down memory lane. And he now brought his son here. Mm -hmm. And that was 21 years ago, you know, my, when I did my first hunt. And, you know, last week, the 10 days I spent with him was just incredible. And with his son, Garrett, and, and what we experienced there, and just did I laugh, and the pictures he pulled out, my first trophy photos, and the places we stayed, and how much the industry has grown yeah. since then, you know. So, yes, I do think young professional hunters, if there's one thing I can say to you, don't be afraid to ask. Mm -hmm. You don't have to know everything in the beginning. I promise you, to this day, I, I hit up all the old guys. Um, I hit them up, and, and I promise you right now, you approach it right, 
Every one of them will answer the phone. Every one of them will spend the time to talk to you. And if you want to know something, choose your time right, and they will help you. I can assure you. But don't, 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 don't take the first time if they can't help you then and there. Don't take that as rejection. Mm -hmm. Just take that the guy's also busy. The guy's also running a business. The guy's also busy with his own safari. Just say, is there time that could suit you? Is there time? I always, I always tell guys, like I said to you, I said, man, you, you said to me, please, I like him. I said, man, my season's busy, but if you can fit in this mm -hmm. period, we can do it. Um, shit, I'd love to do another podcast here. I welcome you guys. Anybody who wants to come and, and visit and whatever I can give back to this wonderful industry that's given to me and continue to give to me, should I'd, I'd, I'd love to be involved and give back in every, in any and every way possible. Uh, yeah, that's a, it's a rare, it's a rare opportunity in this industry because, like you said, there's a lot of outfitters out there that have got this competitiveness and it does get a little bit nasty so um for you to afford a youngster that opportunity i mean it's it's huge but god before before we jump around to phs because i do want to chat about it because i think the way you your company set up is is incredible and it's unlike i've ever seen before but i just wanted to touch base on on something with with uh, conservation last about two weeks ago i did a podcast on south african hunting industry and how it's evolved a lot came from that and one of the questions were and it was to John X specifically with price hiking animals within the area yeah. and I, I took a moment and, and I kind of like absorbed this question and I thought you know what it maybe he's got a point but my experiences as as a young outfitter as a PH or whatever it may be when I'm hunting a specific area Queenstown for instance the Cathcart region and I'll bump into a farmer, for instance, and Kenny Brown, the other day I say to him, I'm Ken, listen, oh, I need a kuru, could I come have a look? He's like, no, sorry, dolls, John X has got the right. So there's a bittersweet moment to to that for me personally, is that number one, I'm like, oh, shucks, a good area gone. But number two, it's in good hands. The question is though, is that with you guys paying premium pricing on a lot of our species, do you think it's had a negative effect on the South African hunting industry? You know, that's a double-edged sword. Mm. And it, it's something I often often get. I've I, I got a good mate, old Llewellyn Paltney. He likes to yeah. tease me every now and then with regards to what, what I did, for example, with Blue Villabias. Truth be told, it's not what I did for Blue Villabias pricing. It's what the market did. Mm. I'm merely a small factor in the market. I'm not the price setter of the market. The market is large. I'm a, I, I'm a little guy uh, managing my areas and placing a value on wildlife that I believe is a value that is fair. Um, do I pay for quality? Yes, I do. Do I pay to protect the area? Yes, I do. Uh, a lot of my farmers will tell you. But at the same time, I expect more from them than maybe other outfitters do. My outfitters, I mean, sorry, my farmers, have to accept my conservation model that i do not share area i i i, I that, that is every farmer's choice it's not me who says he must stick with me i'm saying this is the ideology you want to shoot five bulls i'm not going to shoot five bulls i'm going to shoot three mm. i'm going to pay you more for those three because i want a better quality and a better aged animal so when i talk about better quality it's not necessarily length or size i want a better aged animal because mm. that is what we do here we do age-based hunting like the financial side takes care of itself. If you do age-based hunting, I will guarantee you 99% of the time, the size takes care of itself. That is one of the biggest factors I see a problem with in hunting areas. Mm. Too many animals come off because why? Farmer X needs to make a certain number in his mind. Mm. The land cannot support that number. Those guys, it's for them to check themselves. It's for them. The guys who say, I've hiked the market. I have not hiked the market in the sense of the entire escape. Have I hiked the market in the areas that are important to be? Yes, I have. Does it work in my business model? Yes, it does. Uh, am I profitable? Yes, I am. Are my farmers profitable? I truly hope they are. If they are not, they need to check themselves on that matter. I can't run their businesses. I can offer them what I can offer, but nothing more. So if one looks at that side of the market, what I have to bring everybody's attention to is for far too long, we ourselves have sold ourselves cheap. We sit in a scenario with the outfitters. Have you? Yeah, outfitters. 
<laughs> so the outfit I've sold, we've sold ourselves cheap. That is a domino effect. Just go and look. Pre-COVID, post-COVID, what a elk hunt costs in the US. Go and have a look what a stone sheep hunt costs. Go and have a look at what these things cost. I'm not saying that I'm going to hike the price for everybody and everything. That's not what I'm saying. All I'm saying is, let's get in line to the value that I believe our wildlife is worth, number one. Give the loyalty back to the farmer who has protected that asset and that commodity. That is what it is. It's a commodity. A commodity ebbs and flows. There will come a time, I assure you, if this rand dollar with the, with, with the election, post-election, with the renewed, I would say, optimism in our country, we are seeing a stronger dollar. There will come a time that I will be going to some of my farmers and saying, if this dollar goes back to 16 to the rand, we need to have a look at this. So my guys understand that point of view where I'm at. But at the same time, I don't think guys can sit back and go, well, it's John X's fault. It's your fault. You are not valuing the commodity. It's your fault. You gave away all the donations. I do not give one donation, not one. The guys say, well, how do you exist in the shows? What are the shows trying to achieve? They're trying to raise funds. So why don't we give them the age old fund? Give them the dollar, give them the euro, do not give them our commodity. Let's control our own commodity. Every organization, Laird Hamblin, dear friend of mine, CEO of SCI, Laird and I spent many conversations on the telephone many, many years ago. I guided Laird, good friend. And Laird will always say to me, Carl, come on, how about a, a, a good donation from John X? You guys, you know, this is, this is something we value on our, on our, you know, on, on our evening function. And I said, Laird, tell me I'll write you a check. What do you hope to achieve? I'll give you a check. I'm not going to give you my kudu. I'm not going to give you my waterbuck, my folly, whatever you, you, you want out of that item. Tell me what you want. I'll write you a check. I'll give you the funds. You fight. You're doing a good job for us from SCI's point of view. The same with Dallas Forest Club. Same with Houston Forest Club. The same with custodians. I, I, I'm not willing to give up the commodity. And that commodity begins with my areas, my farmers, and what we value. And that is how I see it. So, yes, I know I've ruffled feathers with this. But at the same time, should we not reward those who are willing to look after these animals? So our hunters and ourselves can enjoy a superior animal and product. Do you think, um, it, it, I get goosebumps thinking about it, because it opens a conversation as well about conservation. And to a South African hunter, um, I think that's a conversation that doesn't like to be had. What they don't understand is that not only are you selling that kudu bull at X amount, you're also selling the experience to hunt that kudu bull. Absolutely. But the, the biggest growth I've seen and the most improved market is the South African market. Mm -hmm. the, the old traditional biltong hunter is, is, is dying. We mm -hmm. can't call him that anymore. He's a serious conservationist. I tell you what, hats off to every one of them and all the corporates in this country because I get inquiries all the time. I'm unfortunately not able to service a lot of those corporates. Um, but guys are placing a huge value on experiences in this country. Um, I, I've met wonderful young kids with their dads that are hunting and I try and, you know, if I see a hunter on the road, I stop, I chat, I want to know what it's about. It's important those youngsters being taken out in the, you know, in the holidays, etc., etc. I've seen a, a upturn of interest in hunting and trophy hunting in this country, not only the traditional built-on meat hunter. Um, so, so we should all tip a hat to them for willing to spend their money, their good money, on those experiences and those hunts. At the same time, I do think for far too long, the meat industry in the venison meat industry has been too cheap compared to mm. what other meat is. That industry, the, the, the South African um, hunter is linked to the venison price. And at the end of the day, you know, if you look at, at, at what inflation has done for the operator, the guy who's offering that hunt to the South African hunter, he's little camp, he's little yachesi, he's bucky, he's, he's tracker. Uh, his little skinning shed, all those little things, all those expenses are up, you know. I, I think a South African hunter, you know, might begrudge me in this, but it's also high time that they also get in line with regards to the value, the true value of what it is compared to other things in this country. If you go and look what it's cost you today to book into the Holiday Inn, mm -hmm. book a flight in South Africa, go to the test match, the rugby test match against the Irish coming up. Um, go and do those things, then compare it to the experience you're going to have for a weekend, a long weekend, a holiday, whatever with your kids. And what the values of that experience, that time. Let's put a value on that time and then the add-ons to that. And tell me 
it's one of the cheapest pesos you could do today at the current rates. You're a fool if you think that you're going to get anything cheaper. That I can tell you right now. Go and travel overseas. Go and do those things. You're dreaming. You know, so, I, I, but, but, but in closing that point, I think that the value, uh, it, it, it's, it, it's, under, it, 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 it's underestimated. I really feel it's underestimated, the importance of what they're doing. I've got one group from Ceres here. I've one corporate, friends of ours that come here every year. Those guys spend incredible amount of money on what is our management game, that we are not moving with our international hunters. It forms part of our annual quota off take to manage our numbers on the ground. And I'll tell you what, we are so grateful for what they do in that group and the funds they generate for us. It, it, it's a massive, massively important part of our industry in the entire country. I, I can tell you right now that, that without them, this industry would not be able to grow and go the way it is at the moment. It's, you know, like I said, I get goosebumps thinking about how you've, you, you mention the animals as a commodity, however, you, you're valuing the whole experience. Yes. Yeah, and and that, that for me, like I say, it's been, it, it's, I, I think I do a very difficult, well, I, I don't do a very good job at ex explaining that. And I think the way you've done it now has just been unbelievable because it's, it's almost like a light bulb moment because you have to try and embrace the whole moment of, of the animal because that they deserve a lot better Absolutely. than just a price tag to their name. It's, it's the experience behind it. And not only that, more than that, the land. That mm -hmm. piece of land there on the place that you wake up this morning, you go and sit on that crowns and you enjoy that view and that moment of finding that kudu bull, that Mount Reebok ram, whatever mm -hmm. it may be, whatever that experience is you're seeking, just take a moment, just pause. I so often on safari, just tell my hunters, just stop. Mm -hmm. Yes, have you looked around you this morning? Have you seen how beautiful this world is showing off? I think it's so important for us sometimes Stop trying to tick through species, tick through a few experiences. I always tell my PHs, you know, like a, a guy comes and hunts and works for me in the beginning and, and Rusty and the guys will tell you, or, you know, my crew, Sticks and the guys, they, they, they'll tell you, you know, from day one, they'll, they'll be the first ones to tell you, you know, if you come in here, don't think you're going to impress anybody at this pub or in this team in the evenings by a pile in the salt shed. But mm -hmm. if your hunter comes in to this pub in the evenings or that fire outside there, and they literally are falling over each other to tell us about what they saw and what they did. That there is what we are after. And that is what I'm starting to see more and more in the South African market as well, which is wonderful. I'm seeing plenty of that. Because animals with conservation efforts, they're, they're always going to be there, right? But the stories and the memories last for... Well, that, yeah, that is it's incredible. And I, I love it. And again... I, you know, I hope I hope we have many, many more of these discussions because I, I could sit here hours listening to how you've perceived things throughout the industry. But um, I do I do want to chat uh, to you about your your safari model, the the Alfredi model. Um, <clears throat> we heading into more of a, a personal scenario for me as 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 a professional hunter. How? How has it been trying to get your team on the same page as you? And I don't want you just to mention pretty much what you have now. What have you done from an outfitter's perspective to help the professional hunters along the way? Because let's face facts. Times are tough out there. The interest rates are high. Fuel is through the roof. Um, the divorce rate in professional hunting, believe it or not, is over 85%. What has John X Safaris done so right? I mean, I saw Rusty the other day, like I said, we went on a hunt and I said, geez, but I, I don't think I've seen you smile this much. It's almost like you're going to get a cramp in your jaw. He's like, I'm just so happy where I am. And what has been your goal or your key behind that success? I think, First and foremost, it begins with a culture of your senior PHs. Um, somehow, I landed up with a bunch of old Queenians. And Queen's College, I think, taught a lot of youngsters a very strong team environment, spirited individual. That, that individual is a team man. I don't know what Queen's did. They did it right. Uh, they most certainly did it right. So I'm a big uh, Queenian supporter, big dog. 
Um, and, and luckily for Ed Wilson's information, Rana Bosch whipped them the other day, my old alma mater. So um, we'll just have that on record, Wilson. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think it begins at the, the top, the culture. Um, then, as an outfitter, this has been a, 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 I'm very lucky. I took older guys who were like brothers to me. I got younger guys I didn't know, but who, whom I knew had potential. I knew these were the kind of guys that I wanted around me. I'm terrible as an individual in the sense that if I don't think I like your style, I don't think my hunters are going to like your style. Okay. I think that soort soek soort. I'm mm -hmm. Afrikaan, soort soek soort. And that is no truer in a, in a professional hunting team. Number one, it's not a luxury to be a good hunter. It's a requirement by the job. What is a luxury is fantastic people's skills and fantastic spirit. That is a luxury. Identify those things, nurture them. I never remove myself from my team. Mm. I am not above my team. I, you can ask any of my guys, if we're skinning a buffalo, I'm skinning deepest to the trackers. I always say there's nothing as a good block drain early in the season because you'll see me run ahead of everybody else, roll up my sleeves and pull out the dirty toilet roll and everything else that comes out of that drain. They know I will do anything I ask them to do, but you can't only talk about it, you have to do it. I'm lucky in the sense that my team don't just talk, they do. Very, very lucky. But that culture comes from, I think, we have a ram camp in our various camps. A ram camp is where the Piatras stay. I stay in the ram camp with my guys. I'm not above my guys in that sense. I share a room with the younger guys and with the older guys. I listen. I have two ears, one mouth. Listen to us speak once. I'm lucky in the sense that by mixing with him, I'm able to familiarize myself with what's happening in their lives. What is important for various guys? You've got various guys in different stages. I've got some of my youngsters desperately trying to hold on to their girlfriend, their first serious girlfriend. I've got some of my older guys desperately trying to hold on to their marriages. We all know this thing. This thing ebbs and flows. It's a balance between this absolute commitment to your hunter, that life, versus your personal life, versus your commitment to raising a family and a life. This is somewhere we have to find ourselves mm. and we have to create that balance. So have I, I don't have the answer. Did I strike it lucky? Yes, I did. I, str I struck lucky. Um, my guys and my team, I've got guys who've been with us for over 30 years. And then of the permanent team, the least experienced guys, eight years in the team. Then I've got some new up and coming youngsters that I'm now nurturing and bringing through the system. They are on year two and three. Are they ready to be guiding full time? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But do they understand the culture? Yes, they do. Do they understand that 3 a.m., no matter what it takes, if I say go, we go? Yes, and that's the culture I want. I'm never going to have a guy lost in this team if he's pulling left or right. You've got to pull with this team. So, you know, very, I'm very glad to hear what you say about Rusty. Um, that's important to us as a team. Rusty, his wife Jamie, his two little kids, those are the important things in our lives, not just for Rusty and Jamie, but for all of us. Uh, the same for Greg and Susie, Ed and Carissa, um, everybody, Martin, his girlfriend, Britt, all these people, they all form a part of this. We all include each other in this, and we're a family at that. And if one of us needs to stand in for another one, I think that's important, that culture. And then I think what is very important, every organization has a don. Every successful no matter what you look in history, every important enterprise, every company, every movement has got a leader. I'm lucky in that sense where I can lead from within myself, but at the end of the day, the chief in charge is my father in the direction of the culture. So I can concentrate my efforts on the product. I can concentrate my efforts on my team. I can concentrate my efforts on my conservation model. I can concentrate my efforts on what tomorrow holds. But the guy doing the dirty work, the guy who makes sure everybody is towing the line in the culture, you can find him 3.30 in the morning. 
listening to Fox News, having his cup of coffee, sharing a moment with the PH, chatting to the, to the, to the farm managers, chatting to the staff, from the gardener to the butcher to the tracker to the tractor driver. He has got his finger on the pulse in the culture of who we are and what we as a family stand for. So I think I'm so lucky. For 21 years, I've run this company. But for 21 years, my father has afforded me the opportunity to grow, to be able to be who I am, to be able to take the company to where it is. I have Lee, my sister, who's my partner in this business, that unconditionally supports my decisions. I, I, I swear to you, I, I don't think Lee ever thinks to ask me a question about it because she goes, Carl's got it. No different to how I believe she's got it in the camps and in our finances. I have my wife, Trish, who is our operational manager, who's running our day-to-day, -day, all our clients' communications. Um, I don't have to look over my soul, shoulder. Trish tells every one of us where we have to be, what camp we have to be in. If we all stay in our lane, we all trust the system, the culture will take care of itself because you have to respect one another's position. Mm. And that is from the top to the appy at the bottom, to the guy running the bush big baits. It's very important. So to come back to the PHS, because they can work in that culture and because the support system is so big in their personal lives, in their work lives and in their futures, I'm able to hold on to guys. The minute you hold on to a guy and you're successful, winning becomes natural. You mm. become part of something greater than yourself and you then give of yourself in a way you would never have because you afforded that opportunity. So for that, I am forever grateful to my team, the guys who make us who we are. It's not about me. I told you this morning, you said, how do you do it? I promise you, Dylan, I am the, I'm this little drop in this bucket. I have the best team in the world. I promise you, if, if tomorrow we have to go to war, we have to go to the Olympic Games and go for the gold medal. Man, I've got my team. I tell you what, I'm going to challenge anybody to take us on that. Not because we're always going to be the best, but I promise you, we're always going to have the most fun. And we're always going to have the best culture within this team. Um, and, and I believe strongly in that. I know you can't comment for other outfitters, but do you think, do you think it's a part of the industry that's horribly overlooked? I, I did a, I used, I, I used to hunt for, for a well-known outfitter and he said something to me the one day and, and it broke my heart in so many different ways is that he said, the movie stays the same it's just the actors that change and that's very you 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 kind of get the impression that you, you know the ph industry yeah, it's yeah, yeah. over flooded at the moment yeah but you get overlooked as as a as a key part of a 100 percent 100 percent um the preferred hunter's responsibility is one thing the outfitter's responsibility of that fresh hunter is a whole nother thing Mm. And if you don't take that serious as an outfitter, and, and I'll put on my PA chat in this instance, by be, beginning at the bottom, who listens to you? Who, who hears your worries in your life? Who hears your worries about tomorrow, where I'm going to find this kudu bull that's driving me nuts and the senior PHs are doing well and they smoke their big bulls in the first three days and day seven, I'm now feeling under the pump here. Um, you have to then, as a team, pick those guys up and get them over the line together. Because all of us pick each other up at different time. I think sometimes what I see around me, it's as if there's two, you've got one side of the table, the outfitter, he sits here, the other side of the table, the PHs. Mm. If you can't marry the two, I don't see how the culture can be right in a company. You have to understand the fresh lantern's point of view, but that at the same time, the fresh lantern needs to respect and understand the outfitter's point of view as well. Um, you know, D Doug and I, Doug Cocroft, my, my big mate, the yeah. image, um, we had an interesting conversation yesterday. He was doing a podcast with somebody overseas and a, a conversation came up about what is your view on professional hunters leaving an outfitting business and, uh, and then taking clients. You know, I, I, I'm, while, while I say the sun shines on everybody, I, I always come back to Perry Mormon where the way he left Chronic Safaris and the way he has built an incredible brand with Sun Africa Safaris, with his son, Perry Jr., and, and their team there. Um, they, if ever there was an example of doing it with integrity and doing it right and walking down the middle of the road without having to look over your shoulders, there is an example of a guy who came out of a, a well-established safari company 
and not for one moment did he have to go to those hunters and go and knock on those doors and make those calls and the Christmas cards and we all know how this goes. There's a guy who built a brand on his own with his own culture from what he learned in our culture. I'll be the first to look after anybody in this team who tomorrow wants to do their own thing. I will support them 200% because I promise you, not the movie star comment, but with or without a team member, we are going to a certain place. We are on our way. We're on this journey. If you want to be a part of that journey, join us. If you don't want to be a part of that journey, that's also no problem. But when you exit, exit with integrity. And that is where I think fresh hunters have a responsibility. That's where a lot of this animosity comes from. That's where a lot of that guy over the, over the table says, you know, do you know what it costs my last trip to the US? Do you mm. know what it costs when I paid those commissions to that client? Do you know what it costs when you screwed up and shot a young kudu bull and you couldn't afford to pay it and I had to make it right and the oak shot another kudu bull? Do you know all these expenses? So I see that side of the coin because I sit on that side of the table. Mm. At the same time, I try my darnest to sit on their side of the table as well. And, and that is where that, that thing comes in, where being in your team. So you have an ear on the ground in, in, in the trenches, so to say. Um, the, that I place a large value on. I know the reality of these things. The, the cost of gain, what it was and what a PH could pay school fees on and what it is today. It's very difficult. It's very difficult for a guy to see his way through that. You know, That's just a downward spiral that the poor PH sits in and he's going, how now? But if he doesn't learn from that, then maybe it's not for him. Mm. That's one thing as well that I have to say in this industry. I've seen for too long, for too many years, PHs who continue down this path, that truth be told, probably it wouldn't have been the best career for them if they had to look back. Are they honest with themselves? Is this the very best you can offer that client for that lifelong dream? I think that's a big deal. I think any young fresh line though, if you're out there and you think to yourself, is this going to be for me? Am I ready for tough personal family life? Am I ready for these hours? Just think about that. Maybe, just maybe, it, 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 it's not what you want. Because there are times that I could turn around and say, man, that guy or that girl, maybe hunting wasn't for them. I, I, I really, and that's just a harsh, honest truth. That's yeah. just what I, it, that's just my opinion, really. Not, not any criticism on them. That's why I mentioned no names. But I've often thought to myself, yes, you would have been a great this or that. And maybe this wasn't for you. But that animosity, I know it's there. But how you married, I think each company has to figure out that culture. Uh, do you think part of, part of your, your success in trusting in a lot of people or trusting the system is, is built on just your optimism in the industry? or Just absolutely, man. What do you think? This, wait, tell me. Tell me. Um, my dear friend Mark Dan, who I've uh, told you about uh, previously, um, Mark, one day in, in Costa Rica, taking me on a fishing trip, the young man, I didn't have, I could, didn't have the money to do this. And Mark said, Cup Junior, you're coming along. And I was lucky. He took me under his wing. And one of the most profound things that came out of that trip, one day we were catching rooster fish. And he said to me, um, he said, you know, Junior, tell me, if you do it right, tell me if there's anything else legal that's a better gig. And it was a profound thing for me in my life. I never thought of it in that way. It was like no other industry that is legal can offer you the opportunities hunting does and what it can provide as a life and a lifestyle and to see the world the way we do. Um, so am I optimistic? Jeez, dude, my cup overflows every day. And a lot of that comes from my father. There's nobody who's happier about every day than him. Nobody who sees so much opportunity. Um, you know, I had opportunity some years ago to leave this country. There is no chance. As I feel now, as I stand now in the way I feel about being South African, being an Eastern Caper, uh, that's a lot to be said about the East Cape culture. There is, I, I couldn't imagine being anywhere else in the world and, and being in such a good place where my family being raised in, in conditions that are truly, I mean, the, the privilege and, and the enjoyment they have of the way they can grow up. I mean, that's what it's about. It's my kids. It's my wife. It's my family. It's those things. And, and the enjoyment that comes from that. And, and, and um, you know, you, you sit back and, and, and somebody will say to you, but, geez, you, you know, you speak from a position of privilege. Yes, I do. But I've earned these privileges. I've earned the right to this land. Um, my mom and dad began with nothing. 
They bought 190 hectares 43 years ago in the Great Karoo at a little side railway siding called Merriman that everybody had forgotten about. And we've been fortunate. We worked bloody hard and we've built a product and we've built up some land and we continue to do so. We've had many, many options. We've had many offers to go. But where am I going? Right here in the Eastern Cape because this is where I believe the greatest future is. Um, this industry is growing. It's going. Um, I, the people I've surrounded myself with, I mean, where else would I want to be? Truth be told, you know. Um, and, and the escape and this culture and living here, my mate Ray Kemp always says, they don't know what we know of the escape. And, that, and, and Ray Kemp is so right about that. Whenever I have a drink with Ray Kat, Ray always says to me, man, don't tell anybody. Just keep it our secret. And isn't that the truth? It's mm -hmm. just something that's so, so unique we have here in a culture and in a place we live. Do you, do you think it's still sustainable for a young professional hunter to want to consider this as a career? You absolutely. Absolutely. The only thing I say to a young professional hunter, do the basics right. I mean, I'm, I'm right now, I'm, I'm in, a, I'm in a, a place where I'm starting to bring in a couple of young professional hunters. So guys don't have to begin with established companies. Uh, guys can begin in companies that are new. Guys can begin in companies that are up and coming. Guys can begin their own companies. That's the beauty about this industry. Um, you know, I've got a, 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 a guy I respect immensely in this industry, Marius Corson, who Marius many years ago was not a, a, a big outfit in this industry. He's a guy who's built up his name, his brand, a guy I respect immensely, a guy I work with. Uh, just because he does things the right way. And, and, and Marius is a, is, a, is a perfect example of not hailing from uh, what we would call an older company and making a hell of a success out of it. Uh, so I, I really think the, there's opportunities out there. How do you differentiate yourself? Find that niche. Find that point that makes you different. I, I think, and, and, and the people skills is so important when it comes to that as, as a young professional hunter. What are, how, how, how would you select a young professional hunter coming through the ranks for, for John X Safaris? Now, I don't mean, yeah. uh, you know, I, I think a couple of years ago when I was starting out in the industry, I think I emailed everyone I possibly could. You know, you're just trying to get a foot in the door. But what is, what is Carl looking at when young professional hunters approach you? I'm looking, approach you. I'm looking for a tidy guy. When you walk through my door, are you, if you got a beard, is it shaved? Are you clean shaven? Or is your shirt tucked in? What, what is your personal pride, number one? When I see you, first impression is a big deal for me. What is your vehicle? What, what, do, what do you look like in your equipment? What is your pride of your existence? That's first and foremost for me. Thereafter, what is your communication skills like? It's very important to me. Can you engage with me? Can you hold a conversation that I find interesting? Number three, are you a team man? Mm. You're not going to survive here if you're not a team man. I don't, I don't do that. I, I, I'm not the one who roots you out. I can promise you now. The rest of this team behind me, geez, they are hard work. They will work you out if you don't fit in. So therein lies one of the biggest secrets. Get them on your side. Once they're on your side, hey, more than likely you're going to be okay. And then like I said previously, it's not a luxury to be able to hunt well. You better be able to jive. And, and when I say, if you want to talk, you're going to have to walk the walk. And that's very, very important. And, 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 and people use that uh, very loosely. That means, unlike countries further north of our border, where guys have the most incredible experience on four or five species that hunt a lot of big five, yeah, where we are in our situation, it's very unique. We have to know how to hunt 42, 43 different huntable species. Each one of those species provides a very different challenge a very different set of terrain very, very different rules you can't tell me that hunting a farley versus hunting a blue darker versus hunting an impala versus hunting a kudu is all the same it's very different you better zone those skills on all those species and then once you've done that are you able to really judge age successfully on those species and harvest the right animals those are the important criteria and the factors that i look at and then a very big part of this, very, 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 very big part for me is 
how do you engage with the trackers? How do you engage with the rest of the team? That's very important to me because I can quickly see the kind of person you are with how you treat everybody around you. So those are just some of the things that I look at. Um, and I think respect is very important to your elders. Massive one for me. Um, I'm a junior. I'm a lighty in this. I've got much older oaks who, who work for me. And I always like to remind them, you don't work for me. You, I, we work together. And that's a big thing. Like A guy has to understand that. Um, respect the guys. Know your place. But at the same time, you're going to have to show if you want to be part of it. Yeah. So, so that, that's just a little bit of our culture, yeah. Um, but get on their side. I'm the least of your worries. Yeah. Carl, um, school fees. One of the biggest questions I get asked a lot on my platforms. Um, I started PH Journals because I wanted to try and find out there was that there was a point in my life where I kind of felt that professional hunting wasn't sustainable. Mm. I kind of felt we were going through a transition stage, especially during COVID, that time after COVID. During COVID, I felt we were we were isolated we were alone um you know beautiful well organizations that were meant to look after our best needs didn't quite do that however i found myself stumbling across john x and spent a lot of time watching your guys youtube i delved more into about what you guys were more about and and not you know izulu a lot of great outfitters out there and I, I couldn't help but find and, and, and really be captivated about how you guys have embraced this pH culture. But one of the biggest questions I get asked on a constant basis across all my platforms is, how do you guys handle school fees? Is it part of the learning process? Do you see it that way? Um, and should professional hunters, youngsters, be penalized constantly for, let's call it an honest mistake? Yes and no. So, also, double-edged sword. If your areas are good and managed correctly and not overshot, that's where the individuals and the outfitters and the PHs have to be honest with themselves. This I can't answer for you or for them. In my areas, my areas are not overshot. I'm very strict on my quotes. If you contact my wife right now and she pulls up her sheep, She's going to tell you precisely where, what, how, what is left, what has been done. Every month, every week, I have all the data. At any given time, I access that. By having that information in my fingertips, I know when it's realistic expectation on a pH and when it's not a realistic. When is, when is it unrealistic? The minute there's a doubt in my mind about an unrealistic opportunity at the success I wish to achieve for that hunter, that client, the problem now sits on my side of the line. I have to change that. It's not for the pH. But remember, the pH is taking instruction from me. I'm saying to the pH, we've got the quote to leave. But what are the pHs telling me? Even though I hunted there in March, and in March I saw three or four more nice blessed like rams that can come off that property. pH comes back and says, man, I don't know what's up, man, but yet I saw only one more ram there, and I don't think we should shoot anymore. That is for me to listen. I can't expect rusty to go to that property and go and have to pull a bless fuck out that he's possibly going to pay school fees on that's not fair number one for the client the guy who've, the, the only reason we're here is the client who's paying to be here so number one it's not fair to him number two it's an unfair request on the ph and number three you're not being true to yourself as the outfitter those are the hard facts those are the truths and you can't hide away from those it's for you to look at yourself in the mirror and say I, the outfitter, I'm the responsible one in this moment for the outcome here. And if I jeopardize my pH or my client, the hit's coming my way. Mm -hmm. So that is how I approach it. Yeah, do we pay school fees? We pay school fees. How do you pay school fees? You pay school fees if you don't achieve the right age. If you make a mistake, you don't achieve the right age, you'll be the one in the evening, go to your hunter and say, listen, as a team, this is not our culture. We'd like to offer you a re-go. That one, regardless, regardless. But at the same time, there's a cutoff to that. It doesn't mean you're going to shoot a waterbuck bull of 23 inches because he's worn down and flat. That's a management animal. That's a different category. 
Okay, management game, not necessarily age-based. That is quality-based. Does it meet the management criteria? That means it could be a one-year-old bull or a 10-year-old bull. If we can see there's a problem there, it goes in the management category. So we've got that category. We off offer that to hunters. We afford that opportunity. So they help us with that. So that my PHs are not caught in that scenario. But at the same time, there is nothing wrong with shooting a 24-inch old flat lechery bull as wide as you can imagine with rounded tips. There's nothing wrong with that. That PH made the best possible call for that scenario in that herd, in that area, to hunt that bull and leave the 27-inch bull with the sharp tips in the herd there. That is the decisions I expect my guys to make. And those are the decisions they are making. And that is why our quality is high and quite easily attainable. I've just had hunters arrive back from the north here while you were setting up. And I chatted to them. The guy said, you know, I've been on four safaris. Uh, this is my first time with Chonix. I've hunted six animals in the last eight days. And every one of those I've redone from previous hunts. And every one of them are by far superior. And when he pulls up his pictures... I don't know where he hunted. I've got no idea where he hunted. But every one of the animals he previously hunted was young. And there, my argument comes back to age-based hunting. I'm telling you now the lengths and the requirements will take care of themselves if you hunt the, hunt the right aged animal. So, PHs, yeah? Do we pay school fees? Damn sure. Yes, I paid school fees the other day. A chemspa. Bad light. I paid school fees myself the other day. A chemspa. Bad light. I thought to myself, yeah, it looks right, the horn color was right, body shape was right, everything was right. Smoked the chemsvak, got there, it still had that rasper, you know, that, that, that skull for horns where, where it's still soft bases. And I was the first to tell my team, thank you boys, I'll take that chemsvak, I'll replace that. Next day I went out and shot a beautiful old 35 inch bull, rock solid horns. And I screwed up. I, I shot the wrong animal the day before, honest mistake, a 37 inch bull, magnificent, should never have been hunted. That's my mistake. Um, I owned it. By owning it myself, as my, when I had my PH hat on that day, not mine for that, I had to correct myself. So as a PH, I screwed up here. And the guys need to own that. You can't expect your PHs to have to abide to your culture if you're not going to do it. So that's very, very important. And, and, and that is big here. And we are, when we have our PH hats on, no matter your position in this team, if you're the oak with seven, eight years experience versus the oak with 35 years experience hunting in this team, you are being judged by your peers who are part of this team and there's a culture in this team. So if you're the 35 year guy's experience and the guy with 10 years experience is that, that wasn't good enough. You better take it on your chin. And that is a unique thing we have here. Before I close the chapter on the PH inside of things, I want, I want, there's two questions I want to ask you. Um, first one is, I, I learned this from John X, by the way. I've been very fortunate to have a lot of Martin and Rusty and a lot of friends within your guys' setup. And I, I, I realized how important the photos are of a safari. <clears throat> I, wanted, I wanted to hear your opinion on it. And secondly, as outfitters in the industry, and I'm talking abroad now, and I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but from what you've seen and from what you've been a part of, do you think... A lot of the time, and, and we'll get into it when we get into the outfitters section of it, do you think a lot of the time the outfitters put unnecessary pressure on the professional hunters? Yes and no, because your, your, your perspective at various age and stage of your career will see different pressures. So I, I, I don't think so. I, I think <clears throat> as a leader... I put pressure on my guys because I know certain guys respond differently with that pressure. Mm -hmm. So that I will say to you. I know a guy like Martin responds very different to a guy like Rusty versus a guy like Craig versus a guy like Ed. Then you've got Sticks who responds completely different and Clayton who responds completely different. So I then take Uncle Dave Bursey and I look at the way he responds, and I know what points I have to touch at various stages to get the results I expect and what I want out of them. Because I'm, I'm a terrible taskmaster, because I'm, I'm a perfectionist, so 
Edwards, Ed Wilson will tell you your opinion. You think it's the only one that counts, my very dear friend. I said, unfortunately, around here, it is the only one that counts when it comes to a picture yeah. or this or that because I have a vision. Sure, and this vision is something that is working. So it's going to count while I'm in charge of the vision. So this is a very difficult thing. That as a leader, sometimes you have to stand up and say, you've got to back yourself in this instance. It's not that my opinion is more important, but you're going to have to trust me on this one. I've got a good feeling on this one. So there is a, a, a difficult thing there, because that's a little bit about I. And I is not part of my culture. So it's a very difficult one. That there I have to lead from a different point of view. In saying that, the biggest disappointment I find in our industry with young fresh hunters is poor pictures. Poor presentation, poor pictures. Um, you know, I'm going to give you a little secret. So many people ask me, why are our pictures that good? Could we work so much bloody harder at them? Mm -hmm. Do you know that every one of my PhDs is getting out of the season? You know what they get from me? They get a chamois. They get two chamois. One for their window, because no client wants to see a bug on a windscreen. I want to see a clean window. Chamois you wash your car with. If I get in your vehicle in the morning, let, let me tell you right now, if you don't polish your shoes in the morning, Greg Hayes will personally, they sell your entree like you're in the military. Okay? They just, they just in, in our kitchen in the morning here, yeah, we meet. From 5 o'clock in the morning, shoes are being polished, coffee is being made. Let me tell you right now, that begins with personal pride in your day. You catch a tracker in this team that is not cleaning a windscreen, that you can literally, you, you can't believe how clean it is. That culture, if it's not clean like I'm happy with it in the morning, that tracker will be in big trouble. Then, a chamois. Everybody gets a chamois from me, sometimes twice a year. That's a nice way of me saying the photos can improve. Yeah. It's not how wet the animal is by your bottle of water your tracker has to clean that animal. It's how well you dry your animal. Mm. I, it, it, my tracker, I have three chamois. I have two different brushes. What effort are you putting into that lasting memory? Because the most important factor at the end of the day, when all is said and done, that hunter goes home. What represents the success of his forest? And remember, even if it wasn't a success, in his opinion, he's never going to admit it's not. He's going to be proud about it. How, do you, how are you represented in that moment? Number one. Number two, if you look at that picture, is that something you're going to share on social media or where there is possibly a sensitive crowd? Because we, we, we're only catering to the middle ground here. The guy who's a hunter, he's in no matter what. Blood, guts, or clean photo. He's happy. He's in. I'm not trying to get him in. He's already in. I'm only trying to get the middle ground. The guy who's anti He's never coming. The anti, he's out. Forget about it. Give it up. But the middle ground is large. How much of the middle ground do we influ influence? If we don't influence it positively, I can tell you right now, children won't be doing what we're doing here today. And then I don't know what the hell I'm going to do here because I don't want a goat farm or sheep farm or cattle farm. So I've got to figure this out. So I've got to do my bit to be able to continue on my journey and to be able to afford my children the same opportunity. Um, Cole, I've, I'm sure your hunters are almost starving here, but I wanted to touch just briefly on 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 the outfitting because, like I said, I hope I hope we get to have many more of these discussions because I mean, like I said, John X has always just been, and and purely thanks to you, I mean your 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 morals and values that you've instilled within the industry. I know I know you've done it on a personal level here. But I think your footprint across the industry, you've done, you've done all of us uh, an exceptional duty. It's, it's been incredible to see the impact John X has had in such a positive way, which is, which is awesome. And so I wanted to ask you something and just briefly on the, on the outfitting side of things. I looked high and low across all platforms. Like I said, I, I, I wanted to bump into you and, and actually ask you this question at the shows, but uh, like some sort of celebrity <laughs> struggled to get in there. <laughs> but uh, I do not see a single package. And I've always been interested in, and, and Rasti's given me a brief version of it, but I, I would like to hear it from your side. You know, first and foremost, your, your words are very humbling. Uh, it's not, I, I'm a normal guy. Um, I, I'm a guy who wakes up in the morning and I forge my way trying to see an existence in the industry that's usually competitive. Uh, so, so thank you very much for your kind words. But the industry 
is so much greater than what my footprint is, what my vision is. I'm just doing my little bit in the greater cause. Um, if that inspires somebody else to do something what I consider the right way, and that's only my opinion, please, I, there are many ways of doing this. I have a certain desire to offer something that is unique in service and quality of product that I'm lucky has afforded me opportunity to have a certain level of clientele. That is, that is where I'm very lucky. But in saying that, why don't you see a package with me? I have one package. I only have a Cape Buffalo package. And it's the most expensive package you're going to get. Only because I feel that is a hunt that is focused 7 to 10 days on one species. It's not a shopping list. I, when guiding, never enjoyed ticking a list. I want to go out. And when I'm out there, I don't want to pass up a great warthog boar opportunity when I'm hunting kudu. And that is why I went for a daddy rat right hunt. I felt that I wasn't hunting. I felt like at that stage, putting my pH hat on, I wasn't the outfitter at that stage when I began. Uh, it was terribly tough having a guy tell me, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going to hunt that bushbuck with once I've got my package. And you're like, you're not going to see the bushbuck again, mate. You must take your opportunity. This is a beautiful bushbuck ram. And, and I sat with that, and it frustrated me immensely. And I decided then and there, this is not the way I'm going to hunt. This is not going to be my way going forward. And then it was like, let's just go back to the basics. In the beginning, there were no packages. My dad was the guy who began packages. I'll tell you a great story about this. He, he was shunned for it. And you won't believe how he figured this out. My dad arrived in the US. A bag of his was missing. He went to a store. He needed a toothbrush. They wouldn't sell him a toothbrush. They sold him a toothbrush, toothpaste, floss, and mouthwash, one pack. He said, I just want a toothbrush. They said, the shop owner in America said, unfortunately, sir, that's how we sell it. He had to pay for all of those things. Package. He went back to the house of the client in Atlanta. He was staying. Sat there. He had a eureka moment. Then and there, he wrote out a package, including a flight. He went down to the local printers. He printed. He went to the show the next day. It flew off the shelf. Nobody had ever done. He was... The brainchild behind this and today his son's trying to eliminate it so how crazy is that yeah you know, so all that came about then when nobody offered packages he came in and offered packages just because he saw a gap in the market mm. um but times have changed the industry changed conservation models have changed not that there's no place in the market for a package there's a place for everybody the sun will shine not everybody in this industry all i leave you with is Whatever you do, will you be proud of it tomorrow? Be sure you can answer that. And I can promise you right now, may that be in every facet of your guiding or your outfitting. And for goodness sake, the whole discussion on ethics. Ethics is for you personally. What is acceptable for me might not be acceptable for her or for him. How much ethics is there in killing? It's a very, very profound thing. I listen to various conversations around the world. Ethics is determined by you and whatever your spiritual well-being is. Figure that out. Answer that for yourself. Are you willing to share that moment with your friends, family, children? Ethically, is that what is correct for you? That's all I ask. All I say, don't judge somebody else because... I can assure you right now, the traditional bow hunter doesn't agree with a compound bow hunter. The compound bow hunter doesn't agree with the crossbow hunter. The traditional open sight hunter will never agree with the old Tasco Winchester 30 odd 6 with the new Gunwork 7 LRM or PRC. We all have a different point of view, but what are we all doing? We're all sustaining and supporting the same wildlife, same conservation model seeing a growth in our numbers and seeing larger areas protected for tomorrow. All the same thing. All, we all want the same thing. We're just going with a different route. Many, many years ago, I heard this, this saying yeah, in, in, in the private cameras of an industry, we are the bearers. We, we, we are the, the pole bearers for the conservation of wildlife. No, you're not. You are an integral part of it. Without hunting, 
and without the big five game reserves and without the landowner who's sheep farming and looking after the natural game on his land, it all plays a role. It all comes together. This is a bigger picture. Greater than one of us or all of us, we all got to stick together. And whatever that is, at the end of the day, the, the most important fact is who wins? The wildlife wins. And while the wildlife wins, we can all continue to do this for many years to come. That is, yeah, that is incredible. And, and you, you managed to find just the perfect ways to put it all in. Because I think, like, again, I've, you've, you often come across guys that are trying to communicate that, that particular message. And no one really does it as well. So, Carl, I, I want to take this opportunity to, to thank you once again. Um, we've got a new little tradition on the show. Um, I'll ask you a question from my previous guest. And the question goes, if you could look back at a younger self 10 years ago, what would be your first call of advice? Yo, you know, I made so many mistakes. Flip it. Now you ask me. First call of advice. Don't settle for second and value yourself. If you don't value yourself, the industry or the product won't either. That's beautiful. Cole, once again, thank you so much. This has been incredible. And I really, truly, honestly, hopefully we can do this again. And um, I want to wish you luck for the rest of the season. It seems like you've got a bumper year right up until October it is. So good luck and uh, just carry on what you're doing. It's, it's, it's an amazing to see. Thank you very much, Dylan. And thanks a million uh, for having me today. And... Uh, yeah, now we can go for a drive and we can see our beautiful wildlife. You and I can have a nice lunch. And uh, next time, maybe we'll do something in the field. Maybe go and hunt, do something and, and catch up in that way. But thank you very much for the opportunity. And uh, to all the young PHs out there, you're the chaps. Do it, enjoy it. And remember, you know, tomorrow it, it might not be there. So enjoy it and do the right thing. I think that's very, very important.